Chapter Twelve of *The Maid of Maiden Lane* by Amelia E. Barr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: A Heart That Waits. Late summer on the Norfolk Broads, and where on earth can the lover of boats find a more charming resort? How alluring are the mysterious entrances to these broads, where a boat seems to make an insane dive into a hopeless cul-de-sac of a ditch, and then suddenly emerges on a wide expanse of water, teeming with pike and bream and eels and fringed with a border of plashy ground full of reeds and willows and flowering flags and alive with waterfowl now close to the manor of hyde the country home of earl hyde in norfolk there was one of these delightful broads flat as a billiard table and hidden by the tall reeds which bordered it but any hyde lying at the open window of her room in the manor house could see its silvery waters and the black-sailed wherry floating on them and the young man sitting at the prow fishing and idling among the lilies and langurs of these hot summer days her hands were folded her lips moved she was asking of some intelligence among the angels grace and favour for one who was dearer to her than her own life or happiness an aged man sat silently by her a man of noble beauty whose soul was in every part of his body expressive and impressive a fiery particle not always at its window but when there infecting and going through observers whether they would or not he was dressed altogether in black and had fine small hands a thin austere face and clean sensitive lips which seemed to say he hath made us kings and priests a man of celestial race valuing things at their eternal not at their temporal worth there had been silence for some time between them and he did not appear disposed to break it but annie longed for him to do so because she had a mystical appetite for sacred things and was never so happy and so much at rest as when he was talking to her of them for she loved god and had been led to the love of god by a kind of thirst for god dear father she said finally I have been thinking of the past years, in which you have taught me so much. It is better to look forward, Annie, he answered. The traveller to eternity must not continually turn back to count his steps, for if God be leading him, no matter how dangerous or lonely the road, he will pluck thy feet out of the net. Even in the valley of death? Be not afraid. Nothing of thee will die. Take these sweet, compassionate words of Jesus as he wept by the dying bed of Joseph, his father, into thy heart. Blessed are the homesick, Annie, for they shall get home. All my life I have loved God, and his love has been over me. Date not God's love from thy nativity. Look far, far back of it to the everlasting love. After death I shall know. Death, he repeated. Death, that deceitful word, what is it? a dream that wakes us at the end of the night. This is the great saying that men forget. Death is life. Yet life ceases. It does not, Annie. Death is like the setting of the sun. The sun never sets. Life never ceases. But certain phenomena occur which deceive us because human vision is so feeble. We think the sun sets, and it never ceases shining. We think our friends die and they never cease living. As he spoke these words, Mary Damer entered, and she laid her hand on his shoulder and said, My dear Dr. Roslin, after death, what then? We are not all good, what then? He looked at her wistfully and answered, I will give you one thought, Mary, to ponder. The blessedness of heaven, is it not an eternity older than the misery of hell? Let your soul fearlessly follow where this fact leads it, for there is no limit to God's mercy. Do you think it is his way to worry a wandering sheep eternally? Jesus Christ thought better of his father. He told us that the great shepherd of souls followed such sheep into the wilderness and brought them home in his arms or on his shoulder, and then called on the angels of heaven to rejoice because they were found. Find out what that parable means, Mary. He whose name is Love can teach you. Then he rose and went away, and Mary sat down in his place, and Annie gradually came back to the material plane of everyday life and duty. Indeed, Mary brought this element in a very decided form with her, for she had a letter in her hand from an old lover, and she was much excited by its advent, and eager to discuss the particulars with Annie. It is from Captain Seabright, who is now in Pondicherry, she explained. He loves me, Annie. He loved me long ago, and went to India to make money. Now he says he is enough and to spare, and he asks me if I have forgotten. There is Mr. Van Arians to consider. You have promised to marry him, Mary. It is not hard to find the right way on this road, 
I think. Of course, I would scorn to do a dishonourable or unhandsome thing. But is it not very strange that Willie Seabright should write to me at this time? How contradictory life is! I also had a letter from Mr. Van Arians by the same mail, and I shall answer them both this evening. Then she laughed a little and added, I must take care not to make the mistake an American girl made, under much the same circumstances. What was it? inquired Annie languidly. She misdirected her letters, and thus sent no to a man whom, of all others, she wished to marry. As Mary spoke, a soft brightness seemed to pervade Annie's brain cells, and she could hardly restrain the exclamation of sudden enlightenment that rose to her lips. She raised herself slightly, and in so doing her eyes fell upon the tall figure of Hyde standing out clearly in the intense white sunshine of the broads, and perhaps her soul may have whispered to his soul, for he turned his face to the house and lifted the little red fishing cap from his head. The action stimulated to the utmost Annie's intuitive powers. Mary, she said, what a strange incident. Did you know the girl? I saw her once in Philadelphia. Mr. Venarians told me about her. She is a friend of his sister, the Marquise de Tonnerre. How did Mr. Van Arians know of such an event? I suppose the Marquise told him about her. I am interested. Is she pretty? Who and what is her father? Did she lose her lover through the mistake? You are more interested in this American girl than me. I think you might ask a little concerning my love affair with Captain Seabright. I always ask you about Mr. Van Oriens. A girl cannot have two lovers. But if one has gone away... Then he has gone away, and that is the end of him. He must not trouble the one who has come to stay. Eh, Mary? You are right, Annie. But one's first love always has a charm above reason. And Willie Seabright was once very dear to me. I am sorry for that unfortunate American girl. So am I. She is a great beauty. Her name is Cornelia Moron, and her father is a famous physician in New York. And this beauty had two lovers? Yes, an Englishman of noble birth and an American. They both loved her, and she loved the Englishman. They must have both asked her for her hand on the same day, and she must have answered both letters in the same hour. And the letter she intended for the man she loved went to the man she did not love. Presumably the man she loved got the refusal she intended for the other, for he never sought her society again. And Mr. Van Arians told me she nearly died as a consequence. I know not as to this part of the story. When I saw her in Philadelphia, she was no more of fragility and gave a delicacy to all her charms. And what became of the two lovers, Mary? The Englishman went back to England, and the American found another girl more kind to him. I wonder what made Mr. Van Arians tell you this story. He talks much of his sister, and this young lady was her chief friend and confidant. When did it happen? A few days after his sister's marriage. Then the Marquise could not know of it, and so she could not have told her brother. However in the world could he have found out the mistake? Do you think the girl herself found it out? That is inconceivable answered Mary. She would have written to her lover and explained the affair. Certainly. It is a very singular incident. I want to think it over. How did Mr. Van Arians find it out, I wonder? Perhaps the rejected lover confided in him. But why did not the rejected lover send the letter he received, and which he must have known he had no right to retain, to Miss Moran, or to the Englishman for whom it was intended? A man who could keep a letter like that must have some envious sneaking devil in his body. A bad man, Mary, a bad man. The air must be unclean in any room he comes into. Why, Annie, how angry you are! Let us drop the subject. I really do want to tell you something about Willie Seabright. What did Mr. Van Orion say about the matter? What did he think? Why did he tell you? We were talking of the Marquis. The story came up quite naturally. I think Mr. Venarians felt very sorry for Miss Moron. Of course he did. Will you listen to Captain Seabright's letter? I had no idea it could affect me so much. But you loved him once? Very dearly. Well then, Mary, I think no one has a double in love or friendship. If the loved one dies or goes away, his place remains empty for ever. We have lost feelings that he, and he only, could call up. At this point in the conversation Hyde entered, brown and wind-blown, the scent of the sedgy water and the flowery woods about him. 
Your servant, ladies, he said gaily. I have bream enough for a dozen families, Mary, and I have sent a string to the rectory. Poor little fish, answered Annie. They could not cry out or plead with you or beg for their lives, and because they were dumb and opened not their mouths, they were wounded and strangled to death. Don't say such things, Annie. How can I enjoy my sport if you do? I don't think you ought to enjoy sport which is murder. You have your wherry to sail. Is not that sport enough? I have heard you say nothing that floats on fresh water can beat a Norfolk wherry. <laughs> I vow it is truth. With her fine lines and strong sails, she can lie closer to the wind than any other craft. She is safe and fast and handy to manage. Three feet of water will do her, though she be sixty tons burden, and I will sail her where nothing but a rowboat can follow me. Is not that sport enough? I must have something to get. I would have brought you armfuls of flowers, but you do not like me to cut them. I like my flowers alive, George. You must be dull indeed if you make no difference between the scent of growing flowers and cut ones. Tomorrow Mary is going to Randforth. You must go with her, and you may bring me some peaches from the hall, if you please to do so. Then Hyde and Mary had a game of battledore, and she watched them tossing the gaily painted corks until amid their light laughter and merry talk she fell asleep. And when she awakened it was sunset, and there was no one in the room but her maid. She had slept long, but in spite of its refreshment she had a sense of something uneasy. Then she recalled the story Mary Damer had told her, and because she comprehended the truth she was instantly at rest. The whole secret was as clear as daylight to her. She knew now every turn of an event so full of sorrow. She was positive Rem van Ariens was himself the thief of her cousin's love and happiness, and the bringer of grief, almost of death, to Cornelia. All the facts she did not have, but facts a little. Intuition is everything. She said to herself, I shall not be long here, and before I go away, I must put right love's wrong. She considered then what she ought to do, and gradually the plan that pleased her best grew distinctly just and even-handed in her mind. She would write to Cornelia. Her word would be indisputable. Then she would dismiss the subject from her conversations with Mary until Cornelia's answer arrived, nor until that time would she say a word of her suspicions to Hyde. In pursuance of these resolutions, the following letter to Cornelia left Hyde Manor for New York in the next mail. To Miss Cornelia Moran Because you are very dear to one of my dear kindred, and because I feel that you are worthy of his great love, I also love you. Will you trust me now? There has been a sad mistake. I believe I can put it right. You must recollect the day on which George Hyde wrote asking you to fix an hour when he could call on Dr. Moran about your marriage. Did any other lover ask you on that day to marry him? Was that other lover Mr. Van Ariens? Did you write to both about the same time? If so, you misdirected your letters, and the one intended for Lord Hyde went to Mr. Van Ariens, and the one intended for Mr. Van Ariens went to Lord Hyde. Now you will understand many things. I found out this mistake through the young lady Mr. Van Ariens is intending to marry. Can you send to me, for Lord Hyde, a copy of the letter you intended for him? When I receive it, you may content your heart. I may never see you again, but I would like you to remember me by this act of loving kindness, and I wish you all the joy in your love that I could wish myself. The shadows will soon flee away, and when your wedding bells ring, I shall know and rejoice with you and with my dear cousin. Delay not to answer this. Why should you delay your happiness? I send you as love gifts my thoughts, desires, prayers, all that is best in me, all that I give to one high in my esteem, and whom I wish to place high in my affection. This to your hand and heart, with all sincerity. Annie Hyde When she had signed her name she was full of content. Her face was transfigured with the joy she foresaw for others, and she thought not of her own gain, though it was great even the riches of that divine self-culture that comes only through self-sacrifice. She calculated her letter would reach Cornelia about the end of September, and she thought how pleasantly the hope it brought would brighten her life, and without permitting Hyde to suspect any change in his love affair, she very often led the conversation to Cornelia and to the circumstances of her life. Hyde was always willing to talk on this subject, and thus she learned so much about Arenta and Madame Jacobus and Rem van Ariens that the people became her familiars. Arenta particularly interested her, 
and she spoke and thought continually of the gay little Dutch girl among the human tigers of Paris, and the thought of her ended ever in a silent prayer for her safety. I must ask some strong angel to go and help her, she said to Hyde. A city full of blood must be a city full of evil spirits, and she will need the wings of angels round her, like a pavilion. So when she comes into my mind I say, Angels of deliverance, go to her. And I think she must be in a great strait now, or I should not feel so constrained to pray for her. And you believe such prayer avails for deliverance, Annie? I am sure it avails. When we invoke earnestly and sincerely the help of any higher and stronger intelligence than ourselves, the angels are with us. They come when the heart calls them, for they are appointed to be ministers unto those who shall inherit eternal life. And Hyde listened silently, yet the words fell into his deepest consciousness, and after many years brought him strength and consolation when he needed it. Thus it is that a good woman is a priestess standing by the altar of the heart. Thus it is that the very noblest education any man ever gets is what some woman, mother, wife, sister, friend, gives to him. Certainly the letter sent Cornelia sped on its way all the more rapidly and joyfully for the good wishes and unselfish prayers accompanying it. The very ship might have known it was the bearer of good tidings, for if there had been one of the mighty angels whose charge is on the great deep at the helm of the good intent, she could not have gone more swiftly and surely to her haven. One morning, nearly a week in advance of Annie's calculation, the wonderful letter was put into Cornelia's hand. She was passing through the hall on the way to her room, when Balthazar brought in the mail, and she took the little white messenger without any feeling but one of curiosity concerning it. The handwriting was strange. It was an English letter. What could it mean? Let any one who has loved and been parted from the beloved by some misunderstanding try to realise what it meant to Cornelia. She read it through, in an indescribable hurry and emotion, and then, in the most natural and womanly way, began to cry. No one could have loved her the less for that sincere overflow of emotions she could not separate or define, and which, indeed, she never tried to understand. It was only one wonderful thought she could entertain. It was not the fault of Joris. This was the assurance that turned her joyful tears into gladder smiles, and that made her step light as a bird on the wing, and she ran down the stairs to find her mother, for her happiness was not perfect till she shared it with the heart that had borne her sorrow, and carried her grief through many weary months with her. Oh, how glad were these two women! They were almost too glad to speak. Sitting still was impossible to Cornelia, but as she stepped swiftly to and fro across the parlour floor, she stopped frequently at her mother's chair and kissed her. She kissed Annie's letter just as frequently. It was such a gracious, noble letter. It was such a delight to know that friendship so unselfish was waiting for her. It was altogether such a marvellous thing that had come to her, that she could not behave as a superior woman ought to have done. But then, she was not a superior woman. She was only lovable and loving, and therefore restless and inconsequent. In the first hours of her recovered gladness, she did not even remember Rem's great fault, nor yet her own carelessness. These things were only accidentals, not worthy to be taken into account, while the great sweet hope that had come to her flooded like a spring-tide every nook and corner of her heart. In such a mood, how easy it was to answer Annie's letter. She recollected every word she had written to Hyde that fateful day, and she wrote them again with a tenfold joy. She told Annie every particular, and she forgot to say a word of reproach concerning the dishonourable retention of her letter by Rem. "'It is altogether my own fault,' she confessed. Even when this letter was on its way to Annie, she was under such excitement that her whole body appeared to think and to feel. Her beautiful hair had an unusual freedom— as if some happy wind blew it into exquisite unrestraint. Her eyes shone like stars, her garments fluttered, her steps were like dancing, and every now and then a bar or two of love music warbled in her throat. And oh, with what joy the mother watched the return of happiness to her dear child! With her own milk she had fed her, in her own bosom she had tended and carried her. Night and day, for nearly twenty years like a bird, she had feverishly, prayerfully, tenderly hovered over her. So there was great joy in the doctor's home and though he would say little, his heart grew lighter in his wife's and daughter's cheerfulness, for the women in any house make the moral and mental atmosphere of that house just as decidedly as the sunshine or rain affect the natural atmosphere outside of it. Now it is very noticeable that when unusual events begin to happen in any life, there is a succession of such events, and not unfrequently they arrive in similar ways. At any rate, about ten days after the receipt of Annie's letter, Cornelia was almost equally amazed by the receipt of another letter. It came one day about noon, and a slave of Van Arians brought it, a piece of paper twisted carelessly, but containing these few pregnant words. Cornelia, dear, come to me. Bring me something to wear. 
I have just arrived, saved by the skin of my teeth, and I have not a decent garment of any kind to put on. Arenta. A thunderbolt from a clear sky could hardly have caused such surprise, but Cornelia did not wait to talk about the wonder. She loaded a maid with clothing of every description and ran across the street to her friend. Arenta saw her coming and met her with a cry of joy, and as Van Ariens was sick and trembling with the sight of his daughter and the tale of her sufferings, Cornelia persuaded him to go to sleep and leave Arenta to her care. Poor Arenta, she was ill with the privation she had suffered. She was half starved and nearly without clothing, but she did not complain much until she had been fed and bathed and dressed, as she said, like a New York woman ought to be. You know what trunks and trunks full of beautiful things I took away with me, Cornelia. Well, I have not a rag left. I have nothing left at all. Your husband, Arenta? He was guillotined. Oh, my dear Arenta! Guillotined! I told him to be quiet. I begged him to go over to Marat. But no, his nobility obliged him to stand by his order and his king. So for them he died. Poor Athanas! He expected me to follow him, but I could not make up my mind to the knife. Oh, how terrible it was! Then she began to sob bitterly, and Cornelia let her talk of her sufferings until she fell into a sleep, a sleep easy to see, still haunted by the furies and terrors through which she had passed. For a week Cornelia remained with her friend, and Madame Jacobus joined them as often as possible, and gradually the half-distraught woman recovered something of her natural spirits and resolution. In this week she talked out all her frightful experiences in the great prison of La Force, and was completely overwhelmed at their remembrance. But the trouble which has been removed soon grows far off, and Arenta quickly took her place in her home and resumed her old life. Of course with many differences. She could not be the same Arenta. She had outlived many of her illusions. She took but little interest for a while in the life around her. Her thoughts and conversation were still in Paris, and this was evident from the fact that during the whole week of Cornelia's stay with her, she never once named Cornelia's love, or life, or prospects. Rem she did talk about, but chiefly because he was going to marry an English girl, an intention she angrily deplored. I am sure, she said, Rem might have learned a lesson from my sad fortune. What does he want to marry a foreigner for? He ought to have prevented me from doing so, instead of following my foolish example. No one could have prevented you, Arenta. You would not even listen to your father. Oh, indeed, it was my fate. We must all submit to fate. Why did you refuse Rem? He was not my fate, Arenta. Well, then, neither is George Hyde your fate. Aunt Jacobus has told me some things about him. She says he is to marry his cousin. You ought to marry Rem. As she said these words, Van Ariens, accompanied by Joris Van Hemskirk, entered the room, and Cornelia was glad to escape. She knew that Arenta would again relate all her experiences, and she disliked to mingle them with her renewed dreams of love and her lover. She will talk and talk, said Cornelia to her mother. And then there will be tea and chocolate and more talk, and I have heard all I wish to hear about that dreadful city and the demons who walk in blood. Arenta has made a great sensation, Cornelia, answered Mrs. Moran. She has received half the town. Gertrude Kippen stole quietly home, and has hardly been seen or heard tell of. But mother, Arenta has far more genius than Gertrude. She has made of her misfortunes a great drama, and wherever you go it is the Marquis de Tonnerre people are talking. Senator Van Hemskirk came in with father as I left. I hope he treated you more civilly than Madame did. He was delightful. I curtsied to him and he lifted my hand and kissed it, and said I grew lovelier every day, and I kissed his cheek and said I wished always to be lovely in his sight. Then I came home, because I would not just yet speak of George to him. Arenta would hardly have given you any opportunity. I wonder at what hour she will release Doris van Heemskirk. It will be later than it ought to be. Indeed, it was so late that Madame van Heemskirk had locked up her house for the night, and was troubled at her husband's delay, even a little cross. An old man like you, Doris, she said in a tone of vexation. Sitting till nine o'clock with the last runaway from Paris a call you have already, and all for a girl that threw her senses behind her to marry a Frenchman. Much has she suffered, Lisbeth. Much she ought to suffer, and I believe not in a rent of fun Aryan suffering. In some way, by hook or crook, by word or deed, she would out of any trouble work her way. I will sit a little by the fire, Lisbeth. Sit down by me. 
My mind is full of her story. That is it. And sleep you will not, and to-morrow sick you will be, and anxious and tired I shall be, and who for? The Marquise de Tonnerre. Well then, Chorice, in thy old age it is late for thee to bow down to the Marquise de Tonnerre. To God Almighty only I bow down, Lisbeth. And as for titles, what care of them has Joris van Heemskerk? Think you, when God calls me, he will say, Councillor or Senator? No, he will say, Joris van Heemskerk, and I shall answer to that name. But you know well, Lisbeth, this bloody trial of liberty in Paris touches all the world beside. Forgive me, Joris. A shame it is to be cross with thee, nor am I cross even with that poor Renta. A child, a very child she is. But bitter fears and suffering she has come through. Her husband was guillotined last May, and from her home she was taken. No time to write to a friend, no time to save anything she had, except a string of pearls, which round her waist for many weeks she had worn. From prison to prison she was sent, until at last she was ordered before the revolutionary tribunal from that tribunal to the guillotine is only a step and she would surely have taken it but for minister morris no twenty miles outside the city minister morris now lives and no time was there to send him word of her street hungry and sick upon the floor of her prison she was sitting when her name was called for bead after bead of her pearl necklace had gone to her jailer, only for a little black bread and a cup of milk twice a day. And this morning, for twenty-four hours, she had been without food or milk. The poor little one! What did she do? This is what she did, and blame her I will not. When, in that terrible iron armchair before those bloody judges, she says she forgot then to be afraid. She looked at Fouquier Tanville, the public prosecutor, and at the fifteen jurymen, and flinched not. She had no dress to help her beauty, but she declares she never felt more beautiful, and well I can believe it. They ask her name, and, my Lisbeth, think of this child's answer. I am called Arenta Jefferson de Tournier, she said, and at the name of Jefferson, there were exclamations, and one of the jurymen rose to his feet and asked excitedly, What is it you mean? Jefferson? The great Jefferson? The great Thomas Jefferson? The great American who loves France and liberty? It is the same, she answered, and then she sat silent, asking no favour. So wise was she, and Fouquier de Ville looked at the president and said, among my friends i count this great american and a juryman added when i was very poor and hungry he fed and helped me and he bowed to arenta as he spoke and after that fouquier de ville asked who would certify to her claim and she answered boldly minister morris when questioned further she answered i adore liberty i believe in france i married a frenchman for Thomas Jefferson told me I was coming to a great nation, and might trust both its government and its generosity. They asked her then if she had been used kindly in prison, and she told them her jailer had been to her very unkind, and that he had taken from her the pearl necklace which was her wedding gift, and if you can believe her renter, they were all extremely polite to her, and gave her at once the papers which permitted her to leave France. The next day a little money she got from Minister Morris, but a very hard passage she had home. And listen now. Her jailer was guillotined before she left, and she declares it was the necklace. Very unfortunate beads they were. And Madame Jacobus said, when she heard of their fate, Let them go. With blood and death they came. It is fit they should go as they came. I enter things as soon as Houquier Tanville heard of them, he doomed the man, for she saw in his eyes that he meant to have them for himself. Well, then, she has also sure that they will take Fouquier d'Anville to the guillotine. After all, it was a lie, she told Joris. That is so, but I think her life was worth a few words. 
and Thomas Jefferson says she was ten thousand times welcome to the protection his name gave her. I thank my God I have never had such temptation. I will say one thing, though, Lisbeth, that if coming home some night a thief should say to me, your money I must have, and if in my pocket I had some false money as well as true money, the false money I would give the thief and think no shame to do it. Overly righteous we must not be, Lisbeth. I am astonished also. I thought a renter would cry out, and that only. What a man or woman will do and suffer, and how they would do and suffer, no one knows till come some great occasion. When the water is ice, who would believe that it would boil, unless they had seen ice becoming boiling water? All a human heart wants is the chance. As men and women have in Paris to live, I wonder me that they can wish to live at all. Welcome to them must be death. So wrong are you, Lisbeth. Trouble and hardship make us love life, as this they give to it. And it is when we have too much money, too much good food and wine, too much pleasure of all kinds, that we grow melancholy and sad, and say all this vanity and vexation. You may see that it is always so, if you look in the Holy Scriptures. It was not from the Jews in exile and captivity, but from the Jews of Solomon's glory came the only dissatisfied, hopeless words in the Bible. Yes, indeed. It is the souls that have too much who cry out, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. For myself, I like not the petty prudencies of Solomon. There is better reading in Isaiah, and in the Psalms, and in the blessed Gospels. Tomorrow, Joris, I will go and see Orenta. She is fair, and she knows it. Witty, and she knows it. Of good courage, and she knows it. The fashion, and she knows it. And when she speaks, she speaks oracles that one must believe, even though one does not understand them. To Aurelia van Zant, she said, My heart will ache for ever for my beloved Athanas, and Aurelia says that her old lover, Willie Nichols, is at her feet sitting all the day long. Yet, for all these things, she is a brave woman, and I will go and see her. Willie Nichols is a good young man, and he is rich also, but of him I saw nothing at all. Cornelia Moran was there, and no flower of paradise is so sweet, so fair. A very proud girl. I am glad she said no to my Joris. Come, my Lisbeth, we will now pray and sleep. There is so much not to say. End of chapter 12